Good afternoon, everybody. People continue to file in. I've got a new setup on my computer here at work. I got, I changed the resolution on my surface so that it matches the resolution of the second screen that's attached to it. I'm thinking that might help with my uh, pen. And I'm also uh, displaying and sharing a different screen. So hopefully that will uh, resolve the issues that I've been having in my little testing here. It seems to be working okay. Um, so we'll see. Uh, when things go wrong, they usually go wrong when you're flying live without a net though. So, hmm. All right. Uh, all right, so here's my schedule for this week. Uh, live class today, live class on Thursday, and uh, office hours uh, tomorrow after lunch, and then Thursday morning. So Thursday morning via Zoom. Um, here's our homework assignments. Uh, let's see, we have uh, that assignment posted. Uh, we have the solution for number one that's posted. Um, and so homework number three is due this Friday at 5 p.m. That's uh, the modeling of the trust. And so then homework number four hasn't been posted yet, but it's coming up and uh, it's going to be due late next week, sometime around Friday uh, is kind of what I have in mind. And what we're going to do is revisit the beam modeling that we did in homework number two and expand on that a little bit using some more sophisticated load combinations and some more uh, sophisticated uh uh, techniques. Uh, so, um, you know, the, just to kind of keep you guys in the loop on on uh, workload planning. So uh, on no, not earlier than September 29th, maybe it would go to early the next week after that, depending on how things go. So we have a couple of different lectures today that I want to discuss. And uh, then um, uh, those were posted this morning on Canvas. So hopefully you guys were able to download those. And um, if not, jump over there real quick and uh, have a look. Um, two lectures, one on load combinations in SAP 2000, another one on output stations. Uh, maybe some of you know what that is. Probably not. So let me shift gears a little bit. Anybody have any questions on homework or any other issues uh, before we get started? All right, then. So these. Uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, they come in, uh, you know, in order. This is uh, what, M4, I think, modeling lecture number four, maybe it's three, M3. Um, there's not, <laughs> there, it's it's hard to define a, a a really logical order, you know, like, like M3 must come before M4 and it's absolute and there's no, it, it's just a lot of different information that uh, I'm spinning out in, in kind of a, almost a random random order and and uh, uh there are some things that i need to discuss before others but uh um in in general it's uh uh um just kind of what i think is going to flow the best and that's uh, the uh, i guess i'm trying to justify to some extent the way that i'm jumping around a little bit on the material so we're going back and forth from we started off with modeling beam then we looked at uh, matrix analysis of a truss and then truss analysis and sap and visual analysis now we're back to loads and load combinations and i'm going to present that in the context of a beam so it's just a, a bunch of information and uh over the the past several iterations of this course i've i've tried to, to hone in on a really good logical way of presenting the material and it, and it's eluded me so far. So if you were to go back and look at uh, notes from previous years, uh, you might see the, the similar information, but presented in a different way. And I think last year I didn't get to the matrix analysis until October. And uh, I think that kind of hindered us a little bit. So uh, that's, I, I jumped in and covered that a little bit earlier, at least the first part of that. Anyways, um, we touched on load combinations when we looked at uh, homework number two with the beams, and we looked at ASCE seven load combinations briefly, but we didn't get into it in a whole lot of detail. And so I want to revisit that today with this presentation. And so many of you are familiar with the ASCE seven load combinations. And if you aren't, 
um, this document, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, it's document number seven. And uh, in this case, I'm referencing the 2016 edition of that document. So it's ASCE document seven, 2016. And that uh, document is basically the standard that we refer to for the loads and the load combinations that we design our structures for, unless it's a bridge. If it's a bridge, then we go to the AASHTO specification, the American Association State Highway Transportation Officials. So anyways, the load combinations that we usually include in our analysis are based on this document, and there are seven of them. The first uh, five are shown here. Um, the first one is dead load, dead load alone. The second one is uh, dead load plus live load acting at its maximum lifetime level with the roof loading. L sub R is the live load on the roof. S is the snow load. R is the rain load. Those acting at their arbitrary point in time value. Load combination number three is the dead load with the roof loading at its maximum lifetime level and the other uh, live load uh, at its arbitrary point in time level. Then load combinations four and five deal with wind. And then finally, load combination six and seven deal with uh, seismic. Now, some of you are aware that there is a newer edition of ASCE 7. There is the 2022 edition. And so the load combinations in ASCE, 2020, ASCE 7 22 are a little bit different. Uh, specifically, the load factor on the snow load changed uh, when it went from 2016 to 2022. Um, not a big difference, but it is uh, it is enough to uh, um, uh, cause some confusion. Just to be clear, uh, in this class, I'm going to use the 2016 load combinations. Um, while in other classes, Joe, I know you're in my other class. Um, I, in other classes, I've been using the 2022 edition of this standard. And so I want to be clear about that. The reason I decided to use the 16 uh, edition in this class is the programs that we use have the ASCE 716 load combinations built in, but they don't have the ASCE 722 load combinations built in yet. And so to avoid uh, confusion there and to allow us to use the built-in stuff, I decided to, to stick with the 2016 edition here. So show you these so that you know that they exist then they go away and we probably won't look at them again for uh, the rest of the, the semester. All right. Now, when we look at these load combinations, there's some things in here that we should know. Um, there's a load factor uh, on live load in combinations three, four, and six that's allowed to be taken as 0.5 if we have a uniformly distributed live load that is uh, not greater than 100 pounds per square foot. So in a lot of the load combinations that I present, I'll put that 0.5 in there, but you kind of have to keep a mental flag and say, oh, gee, if the live load comes from a source that's greater than 100 pounds per square foot, then that factor has to go back to 1.0 instead of 0.5. Okay, there's uh, also uh, numerous permutations that we consider. Uh, in uh, a lot of these combinations, we have OR statements. So in combinations two, three, and four, for example, we have L sub R, the roof live load, or we have S, the snow load, or we have R, the rain load. And so what I do in a lot of those cases is I'll define one parameter that represents the governing value of that. Uh, in this case, I'll take R as a governing roof load. And then that simplifies the equations a little bit. Um, so then we can rewrite those equations like this, where we have 0.5 times the roof loading R. So it's a little bit confusing in that I have R for the rain load in some cases. And then in other cases, I have R that stands for the roof load, which is the maximum of LR, uh, S or R. But uh, I think it's manageable. And when we look at the, uh, the way that all these permutations shake out, I think you can... Uh, appreciate the utility of that uh, uh, that notation. So what is it? Uh, I forget. Uh, so I think it's something like 26 different permutations. There's only seven load combinations, but if you break it out with all the ors and such, there's uh, like 26 or 30 different cases that we need to consider. And this is just for ASCE 7. When we go in and look at the AASHTO uh, standard uh, for doing modeling for bridges, there's a, a whole table of load combinations to consider there as well. So um, the way that it breaks down is if you have a steel bridge that you're looking at, these are the four load combinations that often control strength one, service two, or the fatigue load combinations. And in this case, DC stands for the 
uh, self weight of the components and the attachments. DW is the self weight of the future wearing surface. And then live load uh, plus impact. So uh, impact in the uh, Ashto specification is taken as uh, point, uh, what is it, 0. 0.33? I think it's it's 0. 0.3 or 0. 0.33. I've forgotten offhand. But so um, those are the load combinations we designed for with steel. And then if we had a pre-stressed concrete bridge, we would have these load combinations. So you have two strength combinations, three service combinations where you're checking for cracking and things like that. And then if you have a reinforced concrete bridge, then um, you uh, you design for these load combinations. So I, I, I'm, I have some uh, pre-recorded videos that you guys could refer back to if you're interested in learning more about this. But I just kind of want to present these combinations as a baseline. These are often what we're asked to design for when we're going about um, a, a structural analysis or structural design. Now, when we look at the uh, ASCE 7 load combinations and also with the Ashto load combinations, we uh, we have to consider the uh, possibility that some of the loads may not be acting. Um, so we might have a case where there is no live load on the structure or there is no roof loading on the structure. And that, in some cases, can actually lead to a critical situation. That can be the worst case on a structure. So I use this uh, two-span beam quite often as an example. And if we go in and look at this, the um, uh, we have a dead load that's always on the beam. You uh, usually don't consider the dead load to be transient. You usually consider that to be a permanent load, so it's always there. But if we had a live load that consists of two, two point loads in each span, then um, this loading situation here would lead to the maximum negative moment over the interior support. So that would give us the maximum uh, bending moment uh, right here. It would be a negative bending moment. But this loading wouldn't give us the maximum positive moment. If we put just the live load in the first span, that leads to the maximum positive moment in the first span. And if we put the uh, live load just in the second span, then that leads to the maximum positive moment in the second span. So it's important, uh, particularly for redundant structures or uh, indeterminate structures, that we consider the possibility that some loads may not be acting and that might lead to the worst case scenario. Now, in the ASCE 7 standard, when you go in and discuss loadings, that's often referred to as a partial loading. And so what we have here is a multiple span beam. So what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six spans. And so we have the influence line sketched here for positive moment in the middle of the third span, in the middle of span CD. So if we wanted to uh, load this beam such that we're maximizing the moment at that location, the middle of span CD, we would actually just load those spans. We wouldn't load spans BC, DE, or FG. On the other hand, if we're looking at the uh, maximum negative moment over support D, then in that case, what we would do is load uh, span A, B, C, D, D, E, and F, G, and we would leave spans B, C, and E, F unloaded. And so this is uh, um, a bit problematic when we go about our analysis because it's hard for us to, 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 um, to set up the loading. It can be challenging for us to set up the loading so that we account for all of these possible permutations. Um, it gets even worse when you consider a, uh, a building structure like this. So in this case, we're looking at the uh, uh, influence line for moment and in, in basically every other bay. And if you wanted to maximize the bending moment, then you would uh, load it with a loading that looks like this. And this is uh, uh, often referred to as a checkerboard loading, which leads to the maximum bending moment in the structure. So how do you go about accounting for that, right? I mean, in uh, the analyses we've done so far, we're basically just putting on a live load and a dead load. So how do we account for these checkerboard loadings? Well, let's go ahead and look at it in SAP first. Um, you know, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, one of those cases where it's much easier to, to handle this sort of thing in SAP 2000, thanks to its uh, features. Um, so I'm gonna start there and then we'll touch on visual analysis at the end of the end of this presentation. So um, I'll start off with a reminder of the different parts of the loading in uh, SAP 2000. Remember, there's three different things. There's the load pattern, there's the load case, and then there's a load combination. So a load pattern is where you define what loads are physically present on the building. So if you know there's going to be a dead load or a live load or a rain load or a snow load, 
you would first define them as load patterns and so that you could then apply the loads. Um, the next is a load case. And this is where you tell SAP 2000 what it is you want it to do with the loads that were defined as load patterns. So if you define a dead load, then you go in and define, uh, I'm sorry, if you define a dead load pattern, then you go in and define a dead load case where you tell SAP 2000, okay, I want you to do a first order linear analysis using the load that was defined as a dead load in, in the pattern dead load. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's what a load case is. And so we're used to seeing this window here, which lets us define the, the, uh, uh, the load cases. And then we can uh, click on one of those and specify more options. And right now we're just doing a linear static analysis when we do this. So we want this guy here to always say static. We want this guy here to always be linear. Later in the semester, we'll come back and uh, play around a little bit with a nonlinear analysis. Uh, maybe today we'll come in here. There's a moving load analysis that we could play with. Uh, but uh, for right now, we're just doing linear static analyses. And then finally, the load combinations uh, are where we tell SAP what to do with the results. So we take the result of a dead load analysis or the result of a live load analysis and combine them using certain factors and to uh, get us the results that we're going to use for our design or our design check. Okay, so let's consider an example where we have uh, ASCE7 load combination number two. Um, we have 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And if we consider a beam like this, just a simply supported 12 foot long beam, we'll say we have a, a dead load of uh, 0.65 kips per foot and a live load that consists of 10 kips at the middle of the beam. Then we could sketch the um, shear force diagrams and the bending moment diagrams that correspond to dead load and live load. So if we are going to combine these, then uh, what we do is we take the results coming out of SAP 2000 and we uh, add them together using the appropriate factors. So in this case, we would take 1.2 times the shear force due to dead load plus 1.6 times the shear force due to the live load. And that would give us a shear force diagram that corresponds to the um, to that load combination. And then when we would do the same thing with the bending moment diagrams, 1.2 times the dead load moment plus 1.6 times the live load moment gives us the, the factored moments. Now, what's important to recognize here is that if we truly define it as a combination in SAP 2000, we're using the results from the load cases that were defined and we're factoring those results. It's not factoring the loads on the structure and then doing an analysis. It's actually doing the analysis and then factoring the results. And that doesn't make too much of a difference when we're doing a linear static analysis. But when we get later in the semester and we go to nonlinear analysis, then that makes a big difference. All right, so these are defined uh, in this load combination window, and you guys have already played with this when you did your second homework analysis, your homework uh, uh, assignment, right? So we have this, uh, and you guys are at least loosely familiar with that. Now, the second option is to consider the load case, right? So here's a load case, not a load combination. They mean the same thing uh, until you get into SAP 2000. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define it as a load case instead of a load combination. And so we take the dead load, uh, 0.65 kips per linear foot, multiply the dead load by 1.2, multiply the live load of 10 kips by 1.6, put those factored loads on the structure, and then we get a bending, a shear force diagram and a bending moment diagram. So the difference between the combination and the case is that with the combination, we're factoring the results from individual cases or uh, factoring the results from individual analyses. Whereas if we define this as a load case, we're factoring the loads first and then doing one analysis at the factored load level. And this would be defined in the load case definition like this, where we have still a linear static analysis over here, but now the loads that we're putting on the structure are defined here in the load case definition as opposed to being uh, defined in the load combination definition. Now, um, right, and that's uh, that's stated right here where the difference between a load case and a load combination. 
Now there are a, a bunch of different load case types, right? We have uh, static, multi-step static. We have modal analyses, a response spectrum, moving load, buckling, hyperstatic, all kinds of different things that SAP can do. We're really just going to scratch the surface when it comes to that. We're going to do uh, some moving load analyses uh, and then uh, basically uh mostly static stuff I, if time permits we'll do some stage construction stuff later in the semester just to show you uh what it is and how it works but uh it would be nice to be able to get into some time history and response spectrum stuff but we usually don't have time to do that all right so that's what load cases are let's not talk about those for the rest of the day <laughs> let's go ahead and define different combinations where we're we're factoring the results of different analyses and then adding them together let me get a drink. Excuse me. All right. If you go in to our load combination definition for SAP 2000, there are five different types of com combinations that we can use. There's a linear add and there's an envelope. And those two are probably... Uh, just as you would expect. You use a linear add if you want to create a combination 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times live. And the envelope case will give you the worst case, uh, will give you the basically the, the bounds of what is the worst case output at any given location or any given member. But the other ones are uh, useful as well. We have something called a range add, an absolute add, and an SRSS. And the, uh, the those can be quite useful depending on the situation. The range add is particularly useful with uh, SAP 2000. SRSS stands for the square root of the sum of the squares. And uh, there's a time and a place to use that. Let's go through them one at a time. All right, let's take this uh, three span beam here. Um, Excuse me. So um, I've got three spans. Uh, I have a little uh, uh, node drawn in here, but the beam is continuous across there. So that can be misleading. And if I had to draw this over again, I probably wouldn't put that there because it kind of looks like a hinge and it's really not a hinge. Anyways, the uh, the loading that I'm going to look at looks like this. I have uh, a point load uh, that's live in span number one of eight kips. That gives me the bending moment diagram that's shown here with a maximum moment of 38.5 kip feet in span, uh, the first span. Then I'm going to consider a point live load in the second span. <coughs> Excuse me. Also eight kips, and that gives me this bending moment diagram. And then I'm going to consider a point live load in the third span, also of eight kips, and that gives me this bending moment diagram. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use... Um, those three loads and uh, uh, as an example or as a basis to illustrate how these different load combination types work in SAP 2000. So let's first consider the linear add combination. And so this is a combination that gives uh, a, an algebraic linear combination of the maximum values for each of the contributing cases. It also gives the minimum algebraic combination of the minimum values for each contributing case. Now it's kind of confusing. Why are we talking about maximum and minimums? We'll come back to that in a second. If all we have are these bending moment diagrams like I showed you, then what's going to happen is that at any arbitrary point, we're basically going to factor the... Um, the uh, the different uh, load uh, results, uh, the analysis results by the factor that we define, and then that gives us the, the resulting case. So if we look here, this is a bending moment diagram for the load in span one. This is a bending moment diagram for the load in span two. This is a bending moment diagram for the load in span three. So if we define our load combination as a linear add where we just take uh, the results of analysis one plus the results of analysis two plus the results of analysis three, then we end up with this. And so note that in some cases we have a negative uh, bending moment and a positive bending moment. So if we look at the uh, bending moment that results at point B, <clears throat> what's going to happen is it's going to come in using load, load factors of one. It's going to take positive 38.47 from bending moment diagram one, and it's going to add a negative 7.18 kip feet from bending moment diagram number two, and then it's going to add a positive 2.35 kip feet from bending moment uh, diagram number three. And so the result is that we get 33.63 kip feet at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. If we go through and do the same thing for point C, 
it's going to take negative uh, 19 uh, kip feet uh, from bending moment diagram number one, negative 14 kip feet from bending moment diagram number two, and positive 4.7 kip feet from bending moment diagram uh, number three. And then we get a negative 28.74 kip feet down there. <clears throat> All right, so it uh, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. It just uh, uses the load factors that you stipulate, and then it adds them together algebraically. Give me one second. Okay. The second type is called an envelope. Um, this combination gives us the maximum of all the maximum values that are defined, and it gives us the minimum of all the minimum values that are defined. And so if we go back and apply this to the same situation where we have these three um, uh, bending moment diagrams, basically what it's going to do is using com uh, load factors of 1.0, it's going to superimpose all three of those bending moment diagrams and give us the maximum values from all three of those. So you can see here at point B, the maximum value comes from bending moment diagram number one, and that's defined there as uh, 38.47. Uh, at point D, the maximum value comes from bending moment diagram number two, and that is a 33.6 kip feet. And then at point C, the minimum value is uh, comes from uh, bending moment diagram number, what was it? Uh, comes from bending moment diagram number one, and it's negative uh, 19.07. So it basically just gives us the bounds of all of the uh, values that we put in. <clears throat> now, one thing that's important, and it uh, takes a little bit of thinking about uh, before you get used to it, is that when we go back and use the linear add, the one, not this one, but the one we did before, if we put in um, regular bending moment diagrams into that, we get single valued output. So let me go back and look at that. Uh, here is the, the result, right? And so at every point along the beam, we have one unique value of output. So we have single valued output from that linear add combination. If, however, we go in and look at the envelope results, let me go back here now, we have a multi-value output from this envelope load combination. In other words, at any point on the beam, we actually have more than one value of bending moment. We have a positive 38.47, and then we have some negative value there as well. Over here, we have some positive value, but we have a negative 19.07. So when we report the output from an envelope uh, command, you know, an envelope combination, we get more than one quantity at every location along the beam. Now, that's not to say that the linear combination will always give a single valued output. You can do a linear combination of something that has multiple value output to begin with, and then you get multiple value output from the linear combination. So if you, you can do a linear combination of two different envelopes, and then you get multiple value output from that linear combination. Yeah, I know this is confusing, but uh, once we play with it a little bit more, hopefully it'll be a little bit more clear. All right, next combination type that we'll deal with is called a range add. And this is one that I really like. Uh, it's in SAP 2000, but it's not in visual analysis. And uh, then this is one of those uh, two or three things that really makes me like uh, SAP 2000. The range add, <clears throat> basically, it will, it will include a load if it contributes to the effect that you're looking for, but it won't include the load if it does not. Um, and that's, uh, that's true. Uh, I, th I think I said that right. So it's true regardless of whether we have a positive or a negative value. I think the best way to illustrate this is to illustrate this. So let's go to this next slide. All right. I have those three bending moment diagrams, right? And when we went through and did our linear add, we just took the, uh, the positive value here, plus the negative value here, plus the positive value here. That was the result of the linear add. But now if we go through and do a range add, it's going to look at bending moment diagram number one and it's going to say, OK, bending moment diagram number one is positive in those regions. Bending moment diagram number two is positive in that region. And bending moment diagram number three is positive in that region. 
So I'm not going to include bending moment diagram number two in this range because it's actually negative. I'm not going to include bending moment diagram number one in this range because it's actually negative. I'm not going to include bending moment diagram number three down here because it's negative in that region. So it takes all of those contributing areas, adds them together, and that gives us the results of the range add. Now, I think I have something here if we go in and look at point B. Yep, there we go. So at point B, we would have a positive 38 kip feet from bending moment diagram number one. We would add negative seven kip feet from bending moment diagram number two, and then positive uh, 2.35 kip feet from bending moment diagram number three. But uh, what it's going to do, it's going to disregard that negative bending moment, and it's going to give us a result of 40.82 kip feet. So if we're going to go and uh, account for the possibility of some live load not being there, in this case, we would get a higher bending moment at point B if there wasn't any live load acting at point D at all. And so using the range add command instead of the linear add command, I guess combination, not command, then the range add combination gives us that result. And so that's what makes this so powerful. But it doesn't always it doesn't only do it just for positive uh, output. It also does the same thing for negative output. It'll go through again now and say, OK, I have negative results in span one in that range. I'm sorry, bending moment diagram number one in that range. I have negative results for bending moment diagram number two in that range and negative results for bending moment diagram number three in that range. And so if we go through uh, and uh, include those and we look at point C, there's a negative moment at point C due to a load in span one. There's negative moment at point C due to a load in span two, but there's a positive moment and at point C due to a load in span three. So when we use the range add combination, it disregards that positive moment now and gives us a result that includes only the negative values. So minus 19 plus a negative 14 gives us a negative 33. And so, it's like a, a Frankenstein combination of the linear add and the envelope uh, combinations. And so this is very um, powerful when it comes to considering the possibility of transient loads not acting on the structure at any given point. All right. That being said, let's move on. We'll talk about the absolute add. Um, this combination, uh, I should go back one more comment. The range add also gives us multiple value output. So when we put in a rate, when we use the range add combination, we're always going to get multiple value output out of it. So you always have a maximum and a minimum at every point. All right, then the, uh, what are we at? The fourth uh, combination type is an absolute add. And what this does is it takes the absolute value of an output, uh, absolute value of moment or axial force or shear force, and it combines those. So if we look at the three bending moment diagrams that we have here, <clears throat> then basically what it's going to do, it's going to give us the uh, um, uh, the result that's shown there at the bottom in yellow. So if we look at point B, for example, it's going to take the absolute value of positive 38 plus the absolute value of negative 7 plus the absolute value of positive 2, add those together and going to give us 48 kip feet. And then um, since we're doing absolute values, basically the, uh, the negative value is just a mirror image of the positive value. And so this is similar to an envelope, but not quite. Similar to a range add, but not quite. Instead, it's adding absolute values of the quantities instead. Now, quite frankly, I haven't found a use for this yet. Um, if I were ever to, to run into uh, one of the SAP programmers or SAP engineers at a conference or something, I would might, I might remember to ask them, where does this come in handy? <laughs> but uh, I haven't had that opportunity yet. So I haven't used this, but know that it is available to you and, and maybe you'll find it to be useful in some case. All right. Um, then the last one is uh, also one that I don't use often, but I understand where it would come into play. And this is the SRSS or the square root of the sum of the squares. And so this combination gives you basically the square root of the sum of the squares of what you put into it. And so um, this is a, a, a good case where, um, let's see, I've got, uh, let me get my pen up here. I'm going to draw in black instead of red. 
there we go. So if you have a structure uh, showing it in plan view, um, maybe it's just a, a simple structure like that. And if you come in and you put uh, wind load acting on it, and maybe you have wind acting in the X direction, and you also have some wind acting in the Y direction like that, depending on how the framing is arranged, you might actually end up with uh, forces in this column. You might end up with a force P that results from wind in the X direction, and you might end up with a force P from wind acting in the Y direction. And so... Um, one of the things that we might do is we might say that if we have wind acting in two different directions, we don't necessarily want to include the full value of both of them. You can't have the full, we don't often consider the full value of wind in one direction acting at the same time as the full value of wind in the other direction. So what you might do is take P design equal to the square root of the force resulting from the wind in the X direction plus uh wind in the y direction i didn't say it quite right but you might do that and so that's where the square root of the sum of the squares comes in handy um for things like that and there's also some dynamic applications as well when you have ground motions in two different directions and you want to consider what's going on in a member right so not something you're going to use in this class but uh something you might find handy in a, a subsequent uh subsequent class All right, so uh, when we go into SAP 2000 um, and define these load combinations, you guys have been through this once. Um, you use this uh, combination window. And you could also recognize that there are built a bunch of built-in combinations as well. And you can go in and add those in yourself. Um, and when you do that, then you get these. So... Um, <clears throat> The uh, uh, the notation there, UDSTL1, that's the, um, uh, um, so the one, two, three, four, five are the load combinations. STL is for steel. I'm struggling to remember what U and D stand for, but those are the, the default load combinations. And so you could go in and look at those if you want to. So here's what UDSTL1 looks like. It's basically 1.4 times the dead load. Um, and you could go in and look at UDSTL2 is 1.2 times the live load. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load plus 0.5 times the snow load, right? And so these are, are useful. Um, so if you properly define your load types in the load patterns, right, we go back here to our load pattern definition, right? And we said that uh, live is a live load, dead is a dead load then SAP knows where the sources are coming from and it can apply the right factors. Um, so if you do that, then you can use the built-in combinations and that's pretty useful. Um, there are also um, an editor that you can use for these. And this becomes useful if you wanna have serviceability limits in there as well as strength limits. So maybe you're designing for drift at the same time as you're designing for strength. And uh, you could define a drift limit in there as well using a user-defined uh, load combination. All right, and so, yeah, that's basically what uh, uh, what we have to offer. Now, there is a button there that allows you to convert those to nonlinear load cases. So remember the difference between a combination and a case. A combination applies the factors to results of individual analyses, whereas a case applies the factors to the loads and then does one analysis. So you can convert those, but um, um, again, we're not to the point where that's useful to us. And even when we are, I've had mixed results when I've tried to do this. So, all right. So uh, I'm going to refrain from launching SAP uh, today. Um, uh, I kind of want to launch SAP, do a beam and show you how this works, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, uh, uh, I've got 20 minutes left. Basically, I'm going to keep pushing through this and then we can illustrate this with some examples on Thursday. Um, the idea is I'll, I'll probably be teaching from home on Thursday and that should work more smoothly from home than it does here in my office, ironically. What do we have to offer in visual analysis? Let's look at that for a few slides. Well, basically, uh, loads and load combinations in visual analysis are defined using the load case manager. Um, and so there's four tabs in that load case manager. The first one is a service case. And a service case in visual analysis is analogous to a load pattern in SAP. That's where we define the sources of our loads. We define this load and say it's a dead load. We take another load and say this is coming from snow load. This is coming from live load, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, so there's some options there. The one that we've used uh, already is this uh, uh, self-weight type. Um, so we often will zero that out and say, do not include, uh, but it, you could include it if you want to. Some other options that are in here is that SAP act, uh, visual analysis actually breaks this down. You can include a load in an analysis, but not include it for design. And so we haven't talked about it, but uh, visual analysis will do, do design checks for you and either using AISC or ACI for steel or for concrete. And you can uh, opt to include a, uh, a load in the analysis, but not the building combination or vice versa. And then this last thing here is a pattern ID. And that pattern ID is interesting because this is um, as close as visual analysis comes to that range add. So you could go in and define um, that live load for the three different spans. Uh, we had this beam here where we had PL1, PL2, and PL3. So you could go in and define this pattern as load, load pattern number one, load pattern number two, and load pattern number three. And what visual analysis will do is it'll it'll uh, count those as separate live load effects. One of the limitations, though, is that it wouldn't automatically account for loads in uh, span one and span three acting together. What it would do is it would go in and would put the live load in span one or the live load in span two or the live load in span three. And so what you might want to do if you use the load patterns in uh, uh, visual analysis is come in and define a fourth pattern where you put the loads in both of those spans together, and then that would give you all the possible permutations. But you can probably tell that as, as your structure gets more complex in multiple stories and multiple spans and multiple bays, then this is not nearly as useful as the range add command is in SAP 2000. All right, the next tab is our load combinations tab, and this allows us to define the load factors that we're applying. You can see that there are a number of different possibilities to include there. Um, we have ASCE7 combinations from 2005, from 2010, and from 2016, both using allowable stress design and load and resistance factor design. We have some built-in deflection checks or serviceability criteria. We have uh, ACI <laughs> check in there. And then we have the international building code combinations. Um, generally speaking, the IBC combinations are almost identical to the ASCE7 combinations. In fact, when we get into the more recent versions, uh, IBC uh, 2020 and uh, ASCE 22, they're all they're identical. In fact, IBC just refers to ASCE 7 in the more most recent edition. So you can go in and you can uh, um, uh, you can use this uh, window to include or exclude different combinations. You can actually create your own factored combination uh, by hitting this button down here. And I don't know exactly how it works, but you can do something from the clipboard here. And uh, uh, so. Yeah, that's uh, where we go for that. And then there's the advanced cases. I'm not going to talk about dynamic cases, but the advanced cases allow us to create an envelope. So if we want to do a moment envelope, for example, in uh, visual analysis, we come down and we basically just check that box and it automatically does the enveloping for us. And that's good and bad. Uh, it's good because it's automatic and it's easy, but it's bad because it's automatic and it doesn't always to perform the way that we expect that it's going to. All right. So um, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do in uh, the next homework assignment is to go back and revisit the uh, homework that you did in number two. Let me bring that up real quick and I'll just kind of give you a, a, a brief synopsis of that. And so in homework number two, what we had was a situation where we defined the live load as a series of point loads acting in each of the three spans. And so what I'm going to ask you to do for homework number four is to go in and to break these up. And I can't write on this. I guess I can. Um, it's a, a, a PDF instead. I'll just use a highlighter. We're going to break it up so that the, uh, the loads in uh, span one are going to be defined as one pattern. Um, we're going to define the loads in span two as a separate pattern and the loads in span three as a third pattern. And then we're going to use the range add combination in SAP 2000. And what you can do then is compare the results you got from homework number two to the results you get from homework number four. And then you can appreciate the presence or the, 
the you can appreciate the influence or the importance of uh, accounting for the possibility that some loads might not add. And then uh, also we'll ask you to do something similar in visual analysis, but it's uh, more complicated and less useful. So we won't go too deep there. And then maybe we'll define uh, a moving load as well if we get to it before I assign the homework. All right, questions so far. Uh, again, most of the stuff that we do in the class, you have to kind of dig in before you get to the questions, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. We're missing somebody. Somebody's still not here, but I'm not sure who. And without, yeah, I'm going to have to look at the, the, the class list after class to figure out who that is. All right. And then uh, we have 15 minutes left. Let me go ahead and shift gears to the second PowerPoint from today. And that one is titled Output Stations. Uh, this is where I really am tempted to launch that, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to avoid that temptation. All right. So in SAP 2000, uh, we have something that's called an output station. And an output station is a location on a member in our structure that is designated for the calculation of our results. So if we were to consider a, uh, a bending uh, problem where we have a beam, if we want to calculate the internal shear force, bending moment, and axial force, we have to do that uh, explicitly, and we can only do it at certain locations. If you, uh, if you go in and tell SAP that you want the bending moment everywhere, what it's going to do is basically chop that thing up into a million pieces and it'll spend the next hour calculating bending moments and shear force diagrams. So what uh, you need to do as a user is you need to tell SAP where you want the results to be calculated at, and then it'll go through and provide output for you at those locations. And thus they are output stations. They are stations along every member where the output is calculated and given to you. Now, by default, SAP will, will calculate um, member actions uh, member action is an axial force a bending moment a shear force it'll calculate member actions at every node so at each end of every element it'll calculate the actions for you and it will calculate those actions at the predefined output stations now for uh, bending moment and shear force uh, what it does is it uses linear interpolation between the output stations and uh, that might be fine for some of your work, but if you want to be more exact, you probably want to define output stations at every location where you want to do your design. And so um, when we do output of our results to tables, that uh, output is only reported at the pre-designated uh, output stations. So the trick is to define a sufficiently high number of output stations so that you get accurate results, but not an excessively large number of output stations so that you slow down the software. So typically what we do is we usually want the output at the 10th points along our, our member. Um, if we're doing bridge design, that's pretty traditional. You take uh, a given span for a girder in between two supports, and we typically uh, chop that up into 10 segments. And so then we have 11 points, one at each end of the span and then nine intermediate points in between. And we usually design and uh, make sure that the girder is satisfactory at each of those uh, 10th points. And uh, we usually consider that to be uh, uh, sufficient. When we do a building design, um, a lot of times we don't need that level of resolution. We can often get by by looking at the quarter points of beams and maybe even the half points of columns. So if we're looking at a beam, we look at the bending moment at each end, the mid span, and then the first and the third quarter point. Uh, when we're looking at columns, columns don't usually have member loads applied to them. So we can usually get by with the axial force and bending moment at each end of the column and then at the mid span of the column or mid height of the column. So anyways, if we want to look at 10 points, then we define 11 output stations for each of the uh, members that we're examining. 
plus, and that gives us the two endpoints plus nine intermediate locations. And so if we uh, look at this, what you do is you go to the menu, you go to assign frame and then output stations, and then you can uh, define uh, where you want those. And so often what I'll do is use this, I'll put 11 output stations along the length of my member. Occasionally, um, you can check that first radio button where you uh, tell SAP to give us, uh, you tell SAP what you want the maximum segment to be. And so if you want it at no further apart than every two feet, then if you have a beam that's 10 feet long, it'll chop it up into five segments. But if you have a beam that's 100 feet long, it's going to chop it up into uh, uh, 50 segments instead. Uh, so that's uh, that can be useful, but it can also be dangerous because you get a lot of output. Um, we tend to see maximum output at points where we have concentrated loads, like consider a simply supported beam with a simply uh, with a single point load in the middle. And the maximum moment is under that point, load, right? And so uh, you can also check that box to tell it you want output under the concentrated loads. Uh, you can also tell it that you want output at intersections with other elements. And so those can be useful as well. So one of the things that we can do is use the diagrams box. Uh, but before we get there, let me go ahead and uh, define a problem. So if I had if I had it to do over again, I would go back and uh, use the same beam for this PowerPoint that I did for the other one. The other one I had 0.65 kips per foot over a what a 12 foot. Yeah, here I've got a different span length and a different load, but uh, whatever. It's 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 fine. It's just yeah. So here's a simply supported beam, 26 long, uh, 26 feet long, and a dead load of of uh, 1.2 kips per linear foot. Um, and a live load consisting of two point loads, each 16 kips. And so if we go through and uh, calculate our uh, theoretical results, the maximum moment for dead load should be 1,217 kip inches. The maximum moment due to live load should be 1,536 kip inches. The maximum deflection due to dead load, uh, 5WL fourth over 384EI should be 0.79 inches, 0.80 inches. And the maximum live load deflection should be on the order of 1.06 inches. So let's go in and look at SAP results. Uh, if we define two output stations per uh, per uh, for that member. Now, one thing to, to note is already, if we look at the bending moment diagram that we expect for dead load, it should be parabolic, right? And so this is a parabola. And so that's right. And we all expect that. This should be trapezoidal. And that's right. But if we go to the next slide, the bending moment diagram that we get for the dead load isn't parabolic, it's trapezoidal. And that's not a mistake. That's just the way SAP handles a problem that could otherwise be quite unmanageable. So what SAP has done in this case is it's gone in and it said, okay, Jim wants two output stations along the length of this member. So he's basically going to define an output station there and there plus the ends. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the bending moment there and there, and I'm going to interpolate. And it's just using a straight line approximation in between those output stations. Now, that looks like crap for the dead load moment, but it doesn't look too bad for the live load moment, right? So it's not, not a terrible approximation. What happens if we go in and use three? Well, right now it's using uh, output stations calculated there, there, and there. And so, um, yeah, it's not uh, not terrible. Now, in, in this case, we actually have an output station where the bending moment is maximum, right? The bending moment is maximum at the mid-span. We have an output station there. So the bending moment that SAP reports is right on with what we would expect. If we go back a slide, there isn't an output station where that bending moment should theoretically be maximum. So the bending moment that SAP outputs as its maximum is less than the maximum value that we would expect, right? We would expect 1,217 kip inches. We're only getting 1,036. So the results that we're getting out of SAP are wrong, right? They're not wrong. We just didn't uh, define the problem correctly. And then you could go on and say, okay, what happens if I use five? And then finally, what happens if I use uh, 11 output stations? And so this gives you uh, an indication. And now finally, with 11 output stations, you can see this is, it's still uh, a bunch of straight lines put together, but it looks kind of parabolic because we have a sufficient number of output stations to make it look smooth. And so, um, 
yeah, so typically what I'll do is define a lot, 11 output stations for each member. Uh, and then uh, that gives me the, the results that I want. But it's not quite that simple. But for right now, we're going to leave it at that. Now, um, if you go in and uh, uh, go to, uh, what is it, display show tables uh, in uh, SAP 2000, what it does is it reports the output at each one of those output stations. And so if I had SAP running, I would show you how to do that. Um, but uh, I'm going to wait until uh, Thursday to, to give you that example. So, um, yeah, and what's the uh, analogous in uh, visual analysis? Well, visual analysis uh, actually does a pretty good job in the results view of giving you the output everywhere. It's a black box. I don't know how it works, but somehow it goes in and figures out where the maximum values of bending moment and shear force are, and it reports values at the points along a beam where you want to know them. And so, it, again, it's good and bad because it works and it usually works OK, but you know, it's one of the, if you don't know how it works, you can't be sure that it's working the right way every time. If you go into the report view in visual analysis, you can actually get tabulated results. And uh, I'll show you how to do that when we get back together on Thursday. Um, the report view is a little bit mysterious as well. Um, you can uh, create a report. And what it does is uh, it brings up a, a uh, uh, a window that makes it look like a word file. And in fact, you can print it to a PDF or whatever, but you can actually uh, uh, ask for a detailed table of results. Then you can click on that table and output it as a uh, comma separated value file. And within that, uh, you can uh, specify a certain offset with for each of the members and those offsets allow you to define results at locations that you want so something that's called an output station in sap 2000 the the analogous setting in visual analysis is called an offset in the table and then what you do is you output that as a comma delimited comma delimited file and then you can import that into uh, sap 2000 uh, import that into excel rather and you can do your manipulations there all right, so um, a lot of information, um, a short amount of time. What I'll do for Thursday is uh, I'll come in and uh, I'll have a beam uh, problem ready that we can uh, tinker with it in SAP 2000 first. Then we can go and look at it in uh, uh, visual analysis and uh, illustrate the use of uh, load combinations and then output stations and then uh, tinker with that. Um, given that you guys have a homework due on Friday at five, though, with uh, some matrix analysis, I'll certainly entertain questions that you guys have at the beginning. Um, maybe I'll, I'll have another quick matrix analysis example of a trust ready to go that we can talk about and uh, give you guys uh, any help you might need for that. So that's my uh, agenda for uh, for Thursday. So um that's it for today i'll hang around for a few minutes for questions you might have but otherwise uh i'm available tomorrow in office hours thursday morning in office hours or i'll see you again on thursday at 12 30.